When I started this podcast, my plan for the first series was to talk about the women in science who have inspired me, but whose contributions have been overlooked by society. I wanted to create three episodes and then move on to other topics. I did not expect that during my research, I would find so many others who have been ignored by history or did not receive the recognition that they deserve. So for my benefit and for the benefit of others who these stories might inspire, I have decided to continue the series. Quoting, I wonder whether the tiny atoms and the nuclei or the mathematical symbols or the DNA molecules have any preference for either masculine or feminine treatment. End quote. Qian Xiang Wu said this at a symposium on women in science. By this point in her life, she had been a key member of the Manhattan Project, author of a standard read book for nuclear physics, and had broken one of the laws of physics. Qian Chiang Wu and her experiments revolutionized our understanding of particle physics. Wu was born in 1912 in Liuho, a small town near Shanghai, in Jiangsu province of China. She was the second child with two brothers. They were all named using a family tradition which involved a phrase which can be translated to heroes and outstanding figures. Her name can be literally translated to a strong hero, Wu. Her father was an engineer and an educator. He was involved in the Republican Revolution of 1911 and the revolt against Yuhan Chikai, the first president of the New Republic, in 1913. He founded the first school for girls in the region and tried to improve education amongst women. He and Wu's mother used to visit families asking them to allow their daughters to study. He encouraged Wu to read and study mathematics from a young age. Wu received her elementary school education from the school founded by her father. She graduated from the school at the age of 11 and moved to a boarding school. There, she graduated top of her class, majoring in mathematics. She attended a public school in Shanghai for one year, where she met the renowned scholar Professor Shi Hu, who became one of her long-term mentors. She moved on to National Central University in Taiwan. Wu studied mathematics but changed her major in second year to physics. She served as a student leader during 1930 to 1934, during which she led several demonstrations urging the government to take stronger actions against the Japanese aggression. She led an occupation of the presidential courtyard which gained them an audience with the president. In college, Wu especially enjoyed taking classes with Professor Shi Huan, who had returned from the lab of Marie Curie, who was Wu's role model. He used to tell Wu stories about Curie and her perseverance in a field dominated by men. Wu did her senior thesis with Shi concerning crystal structure and Bragg's law on X-ray diffraction. In a crystal, all atoms are nearly at equal distances. A wavelength of light falling on it matches with the distance between the atoms, you can get constructive interference. You can use this effect to find the distances between atoms and study the structure of crystals. She graduated in 1934 with top honors at the top of her class and earned a Bachelor of Science degree. She worked as a teaching assistant for a year at Physics Department of the National Chikyang University in Hangzhou. Wu then moved to a research assistant position at the Academy of Sinkas Institute of Physics in Shanghai. There she worked on X-ray crystallography under Zheng Wai Hu, who had received her PhD in physics from the University of Michigan. With financial support from her family and encouragement from Ku, she decided to do her PhD from the University of Michigan, same as Ku. She learned some English and boarded the ship christened President Hoover, bound for San Francisco in USA. Shortly after reaching San Francisco, she visited the University of California at Berkeley. There she met Luke Xia Liu Huan, who had arrived from China just a few weeks before her. She later learned that Luke was the grandson of Yuhan Shikai, the president who her father had protested back in 1913. Luke gave her a tour of the campus and introduced her to Professor Ernest Lawrence. Wu's interest in the radiation lab at physics department, coupled with Professor Lawrence and Luke's persuasion, convinced her to enroll there. 
Additionally, she had also heard of the discriminatory policies of University of Michigan, such as their rule against women in student unions and against women using the front entrance of the campus, which made her decision easier. Wu's official advisor was Professor Lawrence, while she worked under direct supervision of Professor Emilio Sergei and J. Robert Oppenheimer. Her PhD thesis involved studies of fission products of uranium and their effects on nuclear reactions. She completed two separate experiments for her PhD thesis from 1938 to 1940. Her first experiment, suggested by Professor Lawrence, was regarding breaking radiation. The radiation emitted from a charged particle being deaccelerated due to an electromagnetic field. Per suggestion of Dr. Enrico Fermi, it was a comparative study of internal and external X-ray radiation from electrons during beta decay. Beta decay is a type of radioactive decay in which beta particle, which is a fast-moving high-energy electron or positron, is emitted from the nucleus. Internal radiation here refers to X-rays emitted by electrons when they come out of the nucleus during decay. And external radiation refers to X-rays emitted when they get deaccelerated, moving through the nucleus's electromagnetic field. Wu's experiments were some of the first to confirm theories regarding these effects. A few other researchers also conducted similar experiments and found contradicting results. Wu successfully defended her results by repeating the experiments and finding the causes for the conflicting results in other experiments. These experiments by Wu marked her entrance into the field of beta decay, a field that she was about to make her own and literally write the book on. The second part of her thesis was reports on her experiments under Professor Emilio Sergei. She researched production of radioactive xenon gas from iodine as a product of uranium fission. This marked her entry into the field of nuclear fission research. Application of her research helped solve the xenon poisoning problem in plutonium producing reactors at Hanford in Washington. Enrico Fermi, who had been asked to explain the fluctuations in the reactor, postulated that Wu's doctoral thesis, identification of two radioactive xenons from uranium fission, was relevant to this problem. Xenon gas, or specifically xenon-135, as identified by Wu, is produced as a result of uranium fission, but is also formed by decay of iodine-135, which is one of the primary products of fission of uranium. Iodine-135 decays into xenon with a half-life of 6.6 hours. Xenon-135 readily captures neutrons and reduces their density in any nuclear reactor. The density of neutrons is very, very essential to controlling the nuclear reactions. This delayed buildup of xenon as a result of iodine decay was causing the peculiar fluctuations with the reactors at Hanford. In 1940, at the age of 28, she received her PhD. She stayed at Professor Lawrence's lab for two more years. Despite making contributions to the front line of her field, and endorsements from Professor Lawrence and Professor Sergey, Wu, being a Chinese woman, could not find a job in the USA. Wu married Luke in 1942 in California Institute of Technology, where Luke had transferred and did his PhD from. They moved to the east coast of the USA when Luke got a job at RCA Labs in New Jersey. Meanwhile, Wu got a job as an assistant professor at Smith College in Massachusetts. Disappointed by the lack of opportunities for research, she moved to Princeton University in 1943 as a physics instructor for naval officers. Only a few months later, she was recruited by the Division of War Research at Columbia University into the Manhattan Project to develop radiation detectors. The end of World War in 1945 was a good year for her. She learned that her family in China was safe and had survived the Japanese invasion. She also received an offer from Columbia University to stay as a senior scientist with a lab of her own. She spent the rest of her career there in the physics department. Luke, meanwhile, found a position designing accelerators at Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island. Her son Vincent Wen Chun Huan was born in 1947, who later became a physicist himself. Her intentions to return to China were delayed. At first, by the Chinese Civil War, then the cutoff of China-US relations in 1949, and finally the Korean War in 1950. 
In 1954, she and her husband decided to become naturalized U.S. citizens. A lot of Chinese scholars settled in the U.S. during this period out of the same concerns. Wu gave her full weight as an experimental researcher to research into weak interactions and neutrinos after this. Fundamental forces or fundamental interactions are interactions which cannot be further reduced to more basic interactions. Four such interactions are known to exist. Gravitational and electromagnetic, the ones which we are more familiar with, have long-range effects that we can see in everyday life. The other two are strong and weak interactions. These work at subatomic distances and are involved in nuclear reactions. These forces can be described as fields. Gravity is attributed to curvature of space-time as per general relativity, and the other three are discrete quantum fields. Interactions on these fields are mediated by elementary particles called bosons. These are described in the standard model. An example can be how photon is an elementary particle of the electromagnetic field. Dr. Enrico Fermi's work in statistical mechanics is one of the pillars of modern physics. His theory of beta decay was elegant and made very specific predictions, but its predictions were being contradicted by some existing experiments. So far, the electrons produced during beta decay were observed to be of lower energy as compared to the energy spectrum shape defined by Fermi's theory of beta decay. Wu understood and realized the problems of existing experiments. She realized that the samples used for these experiments were thick and the electrons were being slowed because they had to travel through the material. She also realized that the magnetic spectrometers with iron cores were causing disturbances in the magnetic field. Wu devised a better experiment, taking these concerns into account, and her results agreed with the predictions from Fermi's theory. These experiments settled all theoretical and experimental debates about the theory. She also investigated different types of beta decay and the allowed and forbidden transitions to test Fermi's theories. These and other experiments by her during this time established her as a recognized authority in the field of beta decay. She briefly shifted her focus from beta decay, but her interest was rekindled when she learned of a new puzzle. Two newly discovered mesons, theta and tau, were identical in mass, spin, and lifetime. Yet one of them decayed into two pions and the other decayed into three pions. Despite repeated and increasingly accurate measurements, both theta and tau seemed identical or the same particle which would mean a violation of the law of conservation of parity. This was termed as the theta-tau problem. When you look into the mirror, you see an identical self, except a few things are inverted. Your left hand is your right hand and your right hand is your left hand. There is no way to tell if you are in this world or in the mirror world. Similarly, if universe was reflected in a mirror, most laws of physics would be identical. Things would behave in the same way. Some properties such as mass, time and energy would remain the same. And some properties like magnetic flux, velocity and positions like your hands would simply be inverted to conserve this identical behavior. This property is defined as parity and is expressed as 1 or minus 1 to represent no inversion or inversion. Parity is multiplicative and must be conserved across any interaction, much like the law of conservation of momentum or energy. Since the two decay patterns produced an even and an odd number of pions, and pions are intrinsically minus 1 parity, it would result in a minus 1 and a plus 1 parity, which would seem like a violation of the law of conservation of parity. This puzzle had led to much debate about validity of parity as a quantum number. Professor Sung Tao Li and Professor Chen Niang Yang of Columbia noted that white parity symmetry had been tested for strong interactions. It had not been tested yet for weak interactions. The best studied weak interactions are beta decays. And since most accurate experiments back then were done by Wu, they approached her. Wu devised a way to test parity conservation or non-conservation in weak interactions. She designed an experiment using cobalt-60 which has a simple decay pattern and would yield an unambiguous result. Cobalt-60 can be polarized accurately using magnetic fields at very very low temperatures. 
She worked in collaboration with National Bureau of Standards in Washington to assemble a cryostat in which crystals of cobalt were kept at very low temperatures. Two sensors were placed at 0 degree and 90 degree to the magnetic field. One sensor was to detect electrons which are given off by weak interactions and the other would detect gamma photons which are released by strong interactions. This would serve as a control to the experiment. Imagine placing a fan in front of a mirror such that it faces downward. The fan in your world is rotating counterclockwise. And since the parity for direction or spin is minus 1, the one in the mirror would be rotating clockwise to your perspective. And yet, both of these would be blowing air downwards. This is the expected result, so that you cannot tell which world you are in. Your fan is always rotating counterclockwise for you and blowing air downwards. Cobalt-60 atoms give off more electrons in one direction, which depends upon the spin. Thus, in a mirror world, they would give off electrons in opposite direction, and you can tell which world you are in. This would be akin to fan blowing in opposite directions in your world as compared to the mirror world. She spent much of the summer of 1956 testing and recording observations. In December 1956, she found reproducible results of non-conservation of parity in beta decay. Sang Dao Li and Chan Liang Yang received the Nobel Prize for Physics for this result in 1957. She was mentioned in the award acceptance speech for being the first to perform experimental verification of this phenomenon. Wu, however, had to wait till 1978 to be appropriately credited for this discovery. She received the very first Wolf Prize for this result. She later went on to say that while she never conducted research for prizes, the exclusion from Nobel Prize disappointed her. However, Wu quickly moved on to the next puzzle. After the magnitude and implications of her famous Wu experiment into parity were ascertained, Leon Liederman, Richard Gavin and Marcel Rendrich of Columbia Nevis Cyclotron Laboratory were able to detect asymmetry in muon decay. This confirmed the universality of the concept of parity non-conservation in weak interactions. P-symmetry violations could exist in other weak interactions than just beta decays. Wu's experiments result went much further than the verification of parity asymmetry. The results implied that the law of invariance under charge conjugation, which is called C-symmetry, was also being violated. Similar to parity, say you invert the charge of all particles and invert all electromagnetic fields. The results and the behavior of the universe should remain the same. This is called C-symmetry. Since if P-symmetry is being violated, C-symmetry has to be implicitly violated to conserve C-P-symmetry. Since then, however, CP symmetry violations have also been identified in weak interactions. Wolfgang Pauli, Wu's close friend who had first theorized the existence of neutrino, was skeptical of the idea of P symmetry violation. He used to call it mathematical trickery. The fall of a law was a shock to many physicists. In many letters between them, Wu convinced him. He yielded to Wu in a 1957 letter which said, I congratulate you, quoting, It is courage to doubt what has long been believed and the insistent search for verification and proof that pushes the wheels of science forward, end quote. Wu's beautiful and definitive work on beta decay established Fermi's theory of weak interactions. Professor Sang Dao Li later went on to describe Wu as one of the giants of physics. Quoting, in the field of beta decay, she had no equal. End quote. Wu's work, however, was far from over. In 1957, theorists Richard Feynman and Murray Gilman proposed CVC theory, which was a major step towards unification of two of the four fundamental forces, weak and electromagnetic, into electroweak forces. When the initial experiments failed to confirm CVC, they turned to Wu, pleading her, quoting, how long did Yang and Li pursue you to follow up on their work? She conducted the experiments and confirmed their theory, significantly changing the world of particle physics. She later went on to study double beta decay and also ventured into biochemistry, studying DNA in sickle cell anemia. Wu began to speak out on social issues, especially on the equality of women in science, speaking about it at multiple venues and advocating government funding for education and research. She retired from Columbia in 1981.
She eventually returned to China but never got to see her parents or brothers before they died. She continued to advise governments on science policy and promoting education for women. Wu, while apolitical, campaigned against government crackdown on students demanding democracy and political reform, including criticizing the Tiananmen Square incident. During her lifetime, she faced a lot of discrimination, not just for being a woman, but for being a woman of color. She persisted and thrived in a time where racism and sexism was out in the open and in policy, based only on her work and determination. The tiny woman stood against the laws of physics and society alike, and they bowed to her.